Go ahead and open your Bibles to the book of Haggai. We're going to be finishing this book up this morning. And as you turn there, I'll do a quick review. Most of you know where we are and where we've been. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about where we're going. Haggai chapter 2, we're going to look at verses 20 through 23. But basically what's going on as you're turning there, most of you know, like I said, uh, Babylon had captured the Israelites uh, many years ago and taken them into captivity. Uh, the Persian king Cyrus took over, conquered the Babylonians, were, was head over the Israelites at that time, let them go back to their land. They began to rebuild the temple. They stopped for about 15 years uh, God chasing them through Haggai and through the lack of crops, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, uh, and at this time, the, the children of Israel are beginning to, I think, maybe hopefully understand what the Lord would have them to do, and that is to obey Him, but not just an outward obedience, an obedience from the heart. We talked about that last week, how the Lord desires that our obedience comes from the heart. It's a heart issue, and God desires our heart. We're going to continue in Haggai chapter 2 this morning, beginning in verse number 20. If you'll stand with me in honor of God's word, beginning in verse 20 of chapter 2 of Haggai, it says, Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth, and I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations, and I will cover... And I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, every one by the sword of another. Verse 23, On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, again, we come before you, recognizing who you are. Lord, you are King of kings and Lord of lords, and I pray, Lord, that today we would see you in all your glory. God, that we would understand that you are coming to rule and reign. And Lord, it's only a matter of time before you do so, and God, I pray that we would live lives worthy of that. With that in mind, that we would be looking, ready for your return. God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts this morning. Help us to understand what you would have to say to each individual here. May your spirit be ever-present, and may you receive all the glory and honor. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. So we know uh, Haggai has been speaking to the children of Israel on the behalf of God, and God is speaking through Haggai. In this last little section, I, I hesitated to preach on just because, honestly, I didn't, I've never really dug into this particular part of Scripture. But as I read it and as I studied it, uh, it was very, very, very powerful and very, very evident that the Lord would have me to speak on this, and I was just blessed this week in studying Uh, This passage of scripture. It's kind of obscure. Not many people know the book of Haggai. Hopefully when you leave here this morning after the last couple of weeks you can go away with a little bit better understanding of what Haggai is all about. And today we're going to kind of wrap it up and talk about a few things. I want to talk about the last call of Haggai. The last call and that's a call to confidence. And we'll talk about that in a moment. Then I want to talk about the coming kingdom. And finally I want to talk about the coming king. But let's begin with a call to confidence. Verse 20 In 21 of Haggai chapter 2, let's look at that again a little more in depth. It says, Then the word of the Lord came a second time to Haggai on the 24th day of the month. Now, this is a second message in the same day as the one we talked about last week. And verse 21 says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. The first call that God gives here in this passage to to I'm sorry, to Haggai to give to Zerubbabel is a call to confidence. Sometimes we need a little confidence booster, don't we? And I believe Zerubbabel needed this confidence booster as well. You see, you had to understand who Zerubbabel was. So let's ask the question, who was Zerubbabel? Now, I want to do something really quick. I'm going to start saying Z, because Zerubbabel is a hard, hard word, a hard name to say over and over and over again. So if I reference Z, I'm referring to Zerubbabel. I call, I've, I've come to know him as Z in my own head and heart, so if you hear me say that, I'll try to say Zerubbabel, all right? But, I mean, after Zerubbabel, after Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, you say it 50 times, and pretty soon you just start saying Zerubbabel, you know? So, so bear with me. If you hear me say Z, that's who I'm referring to. Uh, but Zerubbabel was, was a person uh, uh, that's interesting on a lot of, on a lot of aspects. It, the Bible doesn't go into very much detail about him, We know first that he was the grandson of King Jehoiachin. Now, King Jehoiachin, the Bible says, was like some of the other kings in that he was very evil. 
He didn't follow the ways of the Lord. He didn't obey the Lord. He didn't seek the Lord. And many of the kings were like that. And so Zerubbabel was the grandson of that king. And then Zerubbabel, therefore, kind of got some of the backlash of the disobedience of those former kings and of specifically of Jehoiachin. He was in the royal line, Zerubbabel was. He was in the royal line of David. Jehoiachin was in the royal line. So basically, you could say Zerubbabel was royalty. That's important to know with the backdrop. Think about where Zerubbabel was. What was he doing? Well, he was the governor of about 50,000 people who had been allowed to return to Israel to build a semi-okay temple. Not as good as the last one. He's not wearing a crown. He's not sitting on a throne. He's not enjoying any of the real royalty that he probably deserves. And it's all because of someone else's mistake. More poignantly, it's all because of someone else's sin. The sin of Jehoiachin and the former kings. God had to chastise the nation of Israel. And yet through all this, Zerubbabel stands fast. And God says Zerubbabel was a man who basically followed and obeyed the Lord as best as he could in the situation he was in. He was the grandson of the king of a king. He was of the royal line of David. But instead of wearing a crown, instead of sitting on a throne, Zerubbabel was the humble governor of a struggling remnant of the Jewish nation. He was simply trying to complete the building of a rather inglorious temple. And it must have been a very discouraging situation. Have you ever thought something would work out a certain way? And then when it doesn't come to fruition, you kind of just sit back and think, hmm, well that stinks. And then something else happens and and it kind of puts even more of a damper on the situation and on and on and on and on it goes. And pretty soon you become discouraged. I think that's where Zerubbabel was at this point. He had tried and tried and tried and he's living for the Lord, doing what's right, living for the Lord, doing everything God has asked him to do. And at this point, I believe he's discouraged. And so the Lord notices and he says to Haggai, listen, I got one more message from you, for you. I want you to tell Zerubbabel, have confidence. I have some good news. You're not going to know all the details, but I have good, good, good news for you, Zerubbabel. And that's where we're going to kind of look at today. But we need to remember Zerubbabel's state of mind, where he was, who he was supposed to be, how he was supposed to be, you know, royalty and being uh, possibly a king on the throne and ruling those people. He was supposed to have all these things. Instead, he gets a congratulations, you've inherited a mess because of the sin and failure of someone he probably never even really knew. That's Zerubbabel's state. That's who Zerubbabel was. So God gives Haggai a message. He says, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something great. And I want you to be confident, Zerubbabel. I want you to be encouraged because this is what I'm about to do. He calls him to confidence. I believe God does that in our lives sometimes. He gives a word of encouragement to you. Maybe it's through another brother and sister in Christ. Maybe it's through the word of God. Maybe it's in your prayer life. But he says, hey, listen, I know things aren't going the way you thought they should go. But it's all right. I've got good news for you. And the good news that he gives Zerubbabel through Haggai is for Zerubbabel. I want to make that very clear. This message to Haggai, or through Haggai to Zerubbabel is for specifically Zerubbabel. But as Christians, as believers, we can look at this and take very much comfort, very much confidence. We can be encouraged by what Haggai says to Zerubbabel by way of the Lord. The first thing that Zerubbabel finds out and the way he gets confidence is the Lord tells him about the coming kingdom. Look down at verse 21 and 22. It says, the Lord says, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah, saying, I am going to shake the heavens and the earth. I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations, and I will overthrow the chariots and their riders, and the horses and their riders will go down, everyone by the sword of another. I have a question. What is the kingdom of God? <laughs> that is a difficult question. Um, I did some research, and I've gone to Bible college, and we've discussed this topic in depth, and really there's no one answer i have some certain beliefs about what scripture says the kingdom of god is but it's a very hard topic we could sit here literally for hours and probably days discussing what the kingdom of god truly is but i want you to know that i believe that it is spiritual in nature but it all it also is physical in nature there is going to be a material physical kingdom of god here on this earth it's important to understand that a lot of people don't believe that that god will actually rule and reign 
and, and there won't be an actual physical kingdom on this earth, but I want to tell you that the Bible says there is. God made a promise through the Davidic covenant. God had made a promise to the children of Israel that he would rule and reign for a thousand years, and he's made that promise. It's a concrete promise to them, and I believe we can take it for what it is, that God will, in fact, have a kingdom, a physical kingdom here on this earth. So with Zerubbabel's co- uh, current situation in mind, what's going on in that, in that area, uh, all, the, all the, the, the persecution maybe and, and the, the reign of the king uh, uh, Cyrus from Persia pressing down on, on Zerubbabel, this is what God says to Zerubbabel. says, I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. Now, God was not saying literally, I don't believe. I think in some sense he was, but he's saying I'm going to, sh- I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth. And he says, I will overthrow the thrones of kingdoms and destroy the power of the kingdoms of the nations. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And it's not going to be on your screen, so go ahead and turn there. I'll give you some time to flip over. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 26 and 27, it talks about what this is going to look like a little bit. In verse 26 of Hebrews chapter 12, it says... In verse 26, And his voice shook the earth then. But now he has promised, saying, Yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heaven. This expression, yet once more, denotes the removing of those things which can be shaken as of created things, so that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. God says, listen, I'm going to shake the things up. I'm going to shake the nations up. I'm going to shake the kingdoms of the world up. And the things that are physical are going to crumble. The things that have been in place for a long time, maybe certain kings, certain rulers, certain governments, they're going to collapse. And instead, the spiritual is going to come in in a physical sense, and I will rule and reign. God promises to shake up the kingdoms and the kings of this world, and they will be shaken. That's a promise to Zerubbabel. Think about Zerubbabel again. Think about his situation. Think about the Persian king Cyrus. Think about the persecution that will come. Think about all the conquering nations, the Romans that will, that will dominate the children of Israel. And you think about all the things the children of Israel went, went through. And think about this. They can go back to Haggai and say, listen, the, the Lord promised something. He promised that he would shake the heavens and the earth. He promised that he would one day come and rule and reign and annihilate all the other nations. Annihilate all the other kings. And that he would take control. That would be comforting. If you're a king who's not a king and should be a king, and all the other kings of the world are dominating you and oppressing you and and have authority over you, it would be good to hear from God Almighty the fact that one day God will take care of all of that. That's a good thought. That's a good thing that Zerubbabel must have heard and took courage in and took an encouragement in. Verse 23 has a specific phrase. Look at it. It says, On that day declares the Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts simply means it's, it's the Lord of the armies. The armies of heaven, referring to stars and angels, and of earth. Now, in this little book of Haggai, only two chapters, the Lord says this phrase ten times. Ten times he says, The Lord of hosts. The Lord of the heavens and the earth, basically the Lord of the kingdoms of this world, the Lord over all kings. He's the the creator, the master, the sustainer, king of kings and Lord of lords. He's basically saying he's sovereign, he's in control, he's the Lord of all the armies. Don't worry, Zerubbabel, I got this under control. Don't worry, take courage. I am the Lord of hosts, I am the Lord of all the armies, of the armies of the Lord, of the armies of the earth, of the armies of heaven. I am in control. And ten times he declares that. Zephaniah 3 I'm going to read some passages of Scripture. And some of them are kind of long, but here's what I want you to do. Please don't turn there. Um, just, just listen. If you're not a listener, do your best to listen to these passages, okay? Because these are some things that, that when you first read them, it can take someone aback a little bit. It's pretty powerful stuff, pretty poignant, pretty, uh, pretty fierce, and, and a little uncomfortable at times. So listen to these passages. Zephaniah 3.8. This is referring to the kingdom of God. It says, therefore, this is the Lord speaking. Wait for me, declares the Lord, for the day when I rise up as a witness. Indeed, my decision is to gather the nations, to assemble kingdoms, and to pour out on them my indignation. All my burning anger for all the earth will be devoured by the fire of my zeal. It's a little scary. 
The Lord is saying, one day there's going to come a time when my wrath and justice will prevail. When I come down on the kings and the kingdoms of the earth, when the nations that have rebelled and disobeyed me, there's a time that's coming where my wrath will come together and be displayed in an amazing battle, an amazing war, where God is the victor. We don't talk about the wrath of God very much in churches. We don't talk about the wrath of God in in our social circles, maybe even with Christian brothers and sisters in Christ. We don't like to talk about the wrath of God. We don't even like to talk about the justice of God. But it is coming. And there's another verse that I want us to look at. Ezekiel 39, 18 through 22. Once again, you don't have to turn there. Just listen. These are prophetic verses. He says, you will eat the flesh of mighty men. What? <laughs> That's a little disturbing, right? It gets, it gets better. And drink the blood of the princes of the earth. As though they were rams, lambs, goats, and bulls, all of them fatlings of Bashan. So you will eat fat until you are glutted, and drink blood until you are drunk from my sacrifice, which I have sacrificed for you. You will be glutted at my table with horses and charioteers, with mighty men, and all the men of war, declares the Lord God. And I will set my glory among the nations. That's a powerful phrase. I will set my glory among the nations. God will be glorified. Despite what anybody does, despite what any other nation does, despite what any other king does, despite what any other person does, God intends to be glorified. And he's given some symbolic phrases here of what it's going to look like when the children of Israel, along with God, or God along with the children of Israel, come in and basically annihilate the nations that have disobeyed him. He continues, and I will set my glory among the nations, and all the nations will see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. And the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord, their God, from that day onward. You know when you were small, you're a little kid, and you got into trouble, and your mom maybe used to say, you just wait till your dad gets home. In a bigger sense, This is kind of what's happening here. Although the judgment's going to come not on the believers, not on the children of Israel, but on the unbelievers, on the disobedient. And God's saying, you just wait. There's a day, there's a time when your dad's coming. And he's going to right all the wrongs. And he's going to execute perfect justice because he is pure and he is holy and he is right and he is good and he is a perfect judge. And when that time comes, his wrath will come down and the nations will be desolate. The kings of the earth will cower. The kings of the earth, the kingdoms of the earth, the nations of the earth, any government that you can think of that is opposed to God will not have a chance. Micah 5, 10 through 15 says, It will be in that day, declares the Lord, that I will cut off your horses from among you and destroy your chariots. I will also cut off the cities of your land and tear down all your fortifications. I will cut off the sorceries from your, from your hand and you will have fortune tellers no more. I will cut off your carved images and your sacred pillars from among you so that you will no longer bow down to the work of your hands. I will root out your ashram from among you and destroy your cities. And I will execute vengeance and anger and wrath on the nations which have not obeyed. God is talking about his divine judgment again. His wrath is coming. You think about our current state of government. Anybody like the government shut down? Crazy stuff, right? And there's always stuff like that going on. I mean, not, maybe not the government shutdown, but you look around the world, you look at current events, you look in the newspaper, you listen to the radio, you watch news, whatever news station, and it's just, it's absurd. You think, how could a person be that evil to kill that many people? How could someone in power take his power and use it for that much evil and to kill and destroy? You think about some of those leaders in our history of our world Nero and Hitler and Stalin and Osama bin Laden. I mean, it's current. It's not like this is all in the past. You think about the dictators and the things going on today, the persecution of Christians, the killing and the murdering, the the, the imprisonment of, of righteous people who are living for God. And you think about the nations, the governments, the just the the sin and, and the despicableness of, of their actions towards humanity. And it's easy to get discouraged. And in some way, I think Zerubbabel felt this. Lord, why are you letting this, why, why did you let the Babylonians come in and, and take us over? And, and I understand Jehoiachin, my grandfather, he was, he was not a good king, but, but my dad wasn't that bad, and now I'm supposed to be king. How come this Persian king is still over us? 
He's not necessarily a godly king. Yes, you're using him, but it, it might have been hard for him to understand. And you think about some of the leaders, some of the people in today and, and in past, the hate, the lies, the suffering that kings and kingdoms and nations and governments have imposed on people. Genocide, death, mass murder. You think about those kingdoms, you think about those nations, you think about those governments, and then you think about the promise of God to one day annihilate them. In a, in, a, in a weird way, that should bring comfort to believers. To know that their king and his kingdom is coming. Isaiah 13, 9 through 13 says, Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel, with fury and burning anger. How many of you guys heard in the last month a message about the wrath of God outside of here? I don't even know if I've done it. How many of you have heard one on the radio, on TV? It, it's taboo today. We, we avoid as preachers and pastors and people of faith, we say, well, the, the world doesn't want to hear that. They need to hear it because it's coming. God is coming and his wrath and his justice are coming as well. And as scary as that is and as awful as that is and as just uncomfortable as that is, man, it's like telling someone, hey, the bridge is out. Your car's going to go over. It's like telling the criminal, hey, there's a judge and there's a judgment day and one day you're going to stand before him. Why, do we, why are we so scared of, of telling people that? Not in hate, not in anger, but in love. Hey, I'm trying to help you. There's going to come a day when you have to answer for the way you lived your life. There's coming a day when you have to answer for the sin in your life. And you won't have an answer, and your only answer is Jesus Christ. This should be a warning to all those that we love and care about, the people we come in contact in with. Listen, I, I know you scoff and you laugh and you think, there's really not coming a day when Christ is coming back. That's just fairy tales. And, and look, it's been 2,000 years and still hasn't returned. But it's not our objective. It's not our job to influence them. It's our job to tell them. God is just. He is vengeful. His wrath is coming. And in the very same breath, say, listen, he's a gracious God. Think about the time he's given you to repent. Think about his love, how long it's enduring, his patience, his long suffering. He's giving you opportunity, even this moment as I speak to you, to tell you, look, there's a judgment coming. You can avoid it if you put your faith in Christ and to leave it with them. That's why the Bible can make the claims that it makes in terms of every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess. And I got to admit, I've dealt and struggled with the fact that pers a person can live in eternity in hell. And God would be so cruel and so mean as to say no. You're going to hell. Forever and ever and ever and ever to burn into anguish and pain and torment. And I think if you're human, you struggle with that thought. But we forget that it, it's not like God hasn't given every single person a chance. We forget that God is, is just as much just as he is loving. And that if somebody straight up rejects the love of God, what else can he do if he's a good God, a good judge, but to condemn them? Because it's not God's choice, it's their choice. Behold, the day, is, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from it. This is very strong language. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil, and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud, and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold, and mankind than the gold of a fur. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble, and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. That's powerful. Man, God's justice is coming. It should wake us up as Christians. It should alert us to the need of those who are lost. It should make us concerned for them. Why do we sit and blame a God who will do his justice and do as a good judge will do and condemn a person and we won't tell people about the coming judgment? How dare we accuse God? We are the people that should be accused. We need to tell people the justice and the wrath of God is coming. But his love is there for them. His mercy and grace is there for them. Zechariah 14, 1 through 9. Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided among you. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle. This is a real event. God is going to gather all the nations of the world uh, uh, together to battle the nation of Israel. And the city will be captured. The house is plundered. 
The women ravished and the half of the city exiled, but the rest of the people will not be cut off from the city. Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as when he fights on a day of battle. The Lord is going to fight against these nations. You will flee by the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains which reach Azel. Yes, you will flee just as you fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Then the Lord my God will come, and all the holy ones with him. Some people believe that this reference, all the holy ones with them, are saints who have died and passed on and are now amongst the army of God. That's a pretty cool thought. Have you ever thought about maybe there's a potential that you, I'm not saying for sure, but there's a potential that you could be a part of the armies of God. When God comes back to fight against the nations of the world, you could be with him, yielding a sword, fighting against the evil and, and, and the destruction, the lies, the death, the governments of this world, the nations of this world, the evil kings of this world, and with the Lord come and annihilate them on the winning side, on the winning team. And I believe that is, is served out in terms of how faithful you were in this life. Well, that's, that's not Bible, that's me speaking. I, I believe that God will reward in that way possibly. That he'll say, listen, you're at this rank in, the, in, in my kingdom. You're at this rank in service. You're at this rank. And so because of your faithfulness on earth, you, or on earth, you get to serve in this, in this facility, in this, in this facet. Once again, not Bible, but man, that, that's just a cool thought to even think of. He, give, he goes on. In that, day, in that day, there will be no light. The luminaries will dwindle, for it will be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night. But it will come about that at evening time, there will be light. And in that day, the living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea, and the other half toward the western sea. It will be in summer as well as in winter. And the Lord will be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be the only one. In his name, the only one. Man, God's going to come back in power and might. You see, the first time he came in humility as a servant, and people mocked him and scoffed him and laughed at him and spit in his face and crucified him on the tree, and he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even the death of the cross. But on that day, on that day, it's no longer the humble servant. It's the majestic king. And he's coming back victorious over all the nations of the earth. And as a Christian, that should give you chills and confidence that your God reigns. Your God is sovereign. He will destroy the nations. All the evil will be destroyed. All the nations put down. And God will be exalted. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He is coming again. And he promises his justice and wrath are coming with him. See, the physical kingdom of God is coming, and the justice and wrath of God are coming with it. And God, through Haggai, gives this message to Zerubbabel. I'm sure Z didn't know what in the world he was talking about in some sense. And I don't know how much details he gave him, but as best as he can, God gives Haggai this message to give to Zerubbabel and says, Don't worry, Dad's coming home. Eventually, we're going to rule and reign, and he's going to sit on the throne victorious over all these nations that you fear. All, all, over all these nations that have oppressed you, your king is coming. And that's the third thing I want to talk about, the coming king. If there's a kingdom, there's got to be a king. Verse 23 addresses that. And it's a little veiled, but this is prophecy. It says, On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring. For I have chosen you, declares the Lord of hosts. On what day? On that day. What is on that day? Well, it's obviously future tense. It's the tribulation, after the tribulation period, when Christ returns, post tribulation, when the armies of the Lord have annihilated the armies of the nations and the kingdoms of this world, the day when Jesus Christ returns in glory and the kingdom of God is made manifest, when Christ sets his foot on the Mount of Olives. That's a real event. Really going to happen. Christ comes back returns and places his foot on the Mount of Olives. It's over for those people. It's over for those nations. They've had a chance. God's mercy and grace had lasted and lasted and lasted and lasted and waited and waited and waited and waited. And then Christ comes and it's over. His justice and wrath will come upon them. And in that day when the kingdom of heaven comes, the kingdom of God comes and his foot hits the Mount of Olives, he comes to rule and to reign in the millennial kingdom. Zerubbabel probably is like, what in the world are you talking about? And God has it all under control. The coming king 
There's a phrase in here. It says, the son of Shatil. And I believe this is a literal physical reference to Zerubbabel. And he says, the son of Shatil, he makes a promise to the son of Shatil. He says, you'll be as a signet ring. And I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shatil, my servant, declares the Lord. And I will make you like a signet ring. This is a promise from God to Zerubbabel specifically saying, listen, I'm going to take my stamp, my ring that kings would wear, and they would authorize and say, yes, I approve. Yes, I approve. Yes, I approve. And God says to Zerubbabel, on your life, on your name, on who you are, I approve. Man, that that would be my life. That that would be your life. That at the end, we would stand before God and he says, well done, good and faithful servant. There's still time to do what God has called you to do. There's still an opportunity to obey the Lord now. And Zerubbabel gets that seal of approval. Not only in that way, and I believe in all of history, and even in the coming kingdom, and even in eternity, Zerubbabel will be remembered as the king who stood for what was right, who did what God asked him to do, who obeyed with his whole heart. He wasn't perfect, but he obeyed the Lord. And and you see that day coming. We have the opportunity to do that as well. But it's also in, a, also in a real sense, God made that promise to Zerubbabel and said, listen, people are going to be able to trace this. You're of the Davidic line. The Messiah is going to come through you, Zerubbabel. You don't hear about Zerubbabel at Christmas time. Maybe this Christmas season, we'll do a whole series on Zerubbabel. You hear about Mary and Joseph and all those people and, you know, and the manger and the wise men. Zerubbabel was a key person in this history of the nation of Israel in which the Messiah would come through. Very, very important person. And you know what? I'm sure that if Zerubbabel had been like his forerunners, his father and his grandfather, whoever was disobedient, if he had been like them, God would have chosen someone else. God would have brought the Messiah through someone else. But I believe he gives us the opportunity to be used, to be a signet ring to put his approval on us. He gives us free will. And if we obey, the Lord will honor us. He will bring glory to us. And in so doing, with the right heart attitude, we will give glory right back where it's due to the Lord. Zerubbabel is speaking to, uh, Haggai is speaking to Zerubbabel, but he's also, I believe, being prophetic, like I said. And he says, I will take you, Zerubbabel, son of Shetil, my servant, declares the Lord, and I will make you like a signet ring, for I have chosen you, declares the Lord the Lord of hosts. You see, I believe the phrase, my servant, and, and I don't know all the details here, I'm just being honest, but I believe that this is a type of Christ. You see types of Christ throughout the Word of God and throughout the Old Testament. You see a, a picture, a foreshadow of what the Messiah is going to look like, and Zerubbabel is set up as a foreshadow, as a type of Christ to come. And we see that Jesus Christ will rule and reign, and God declares that he has chosen him, he has set him up, to be the ruler and the reigner, to be the king of kings, and to be the lord of lords. And when that kingdom is ushered in, he will sit on that rightful throne. And Jesus Christ will one day rule and reign victorious over the entire world. And it is he who will sit on the throne of the universe, and he will take his rightful place, approved by God. This is my son, in whom I am well pleased, he said. When John baptized him, All everything points to Christ returning and taking his rightful place as king. As a believer, that should make your heart smile. That should make your heart joyful. That should give you confidence. That should give you courage. When everything in this world seems to be falling apart, you should take comfort and confidence in knowing that your king will reign. Yes, he is sovereign now. Yes, he is in control now. But one day, everyone else that laughs at you and mocks you and persecutes you for being a Christian, (laughs) their knee's going to bow. They're going to see it with their own eyes. Revelation 1-7 says this, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Be sure, there is a king, and he is coming to rule and to reign over all the nations forever in his righteous glory and his name is King Jesus. Therefore, Zerubbabel, therefore, Christian, therefore, church, be confident, be confident, be confident. Your king is coming. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your grace, your mercy, 
Lord, that you love us so much that you are patient with us, that you are long-suffering. God, that you are just waiting for us to repent and to turn to you. And God, you have done this for so long that anybody would interpret this as a failure on your part, as ignorance and rebellion. I pray, Lord, that if there's someone in here today that doesn't know you as their king, as their savior, as their Lord, that has not put their trust in you, that today they would make you the Lord of their life, that they would simply admit their sin, turn to you, and ask for forgiveness, and put their trust in Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace and your mercy as it endures, as your patience endures, your long-suffering endures. Lord, I pray that we as a people would become aware of the situation of our friends, relatives, co-workers, neighbors, anyone that's beside us, beside us that, that we live with and walk amongst, Lord, that, that we would realize and help them realize that there's a judgment day coming, that the wrath of God is coming, that justice is coming, and that there's a king coming who will rule and reign in a real way. And yet, Lord, you are waiting and patient and long-suffering and gracious and merciful and desire that all people come to you, that we would make that message urgent. And Lord, for believers in here who are living outside of your will, who are being disobedient, God, if you were to come back today, how is their heart? How is my heart before you? Help us always to be living, looking for the King, ready and unashamed that if you were to come back this moment, that we would say glory to God and not be ashamed of what we were doing at that time. We thank you, we praise you for what you're doing in our lives, in our church. I pray, Lord, that this message would dig down deep in our soul and that we would remember that our king is coming that we would live in a manner worthy of that knowledge we thank you we praise you and we give all you the praise and all the glory in christ's name i pray amen would you stand and continue worshiping